Our visitor, um, which is no doubt known to many of you, Aaron Tassar, was born in Royal Oak. That's the best I can do um, here. Um, his veins may not actually bleed maize and blue. He left when he was nine months old, but nonetheless, um, there is that Michigan connection. Um, thereafter, he did well for himself at the Michigan of the West, um, Stanford, uh, where he went for his undergraduate work, and now um, at another institution, the Michigan of the East, I think we would call it, um, where he is a lecturer in the Department of History at Harvard. Um, he's teaching Central Asian history there, and he is currently a postdoctoral fellow at the Davis Center, and will be moving next year to Washington University in St. Louis. Congratulations. Um, he earned his PhD last year at Harvard. Um, he worked with Terry Martin with a dissertation called Soviet and Muslim, the Institutionalization of Islam in Central Asia from 1943 to 91. Um, and he also spent a year um, before going to Harvard, I think, working for IREX, was that, was, that was before Harvard, right? Um, where he met with all kinds of religious and political figures in Uzbekistan, negotiating with the Uzbekistani government to enact programs that furthered cultural and religious Pluralism, this happened in 2003 to 4. So those of you familiar with Central Asian and Uzbekistani history in particular can imagine the range of interesting conversational opportunities this must have opened for him during that year. I'll leave it there. Um, his scholarly and personal background therefore puts him squarely at the forefront of many different waves in our field working on the war and post-war period. This is something that many scholars are now turning to, the 60s, 70s, and beyond. Central Asian history, looking at Central Asia in its own right, that is not as a part and parcel of other stories. He knows Uzbek, Kyrgyz, Tajik, Turkish, in addition to Russian. Religious studies, again, in their own right, seeing Islam not simply as a package to be opposed to the Soviet state, as previous generations of scholars tended to, but thinking about what a Central Asian kind of Islam means and what it looks like to people in the region. And lastly, a transnational sort of approach to queries that cross out of traditional national boundaries and boxes. Um, and that's something that is related to the part of this work that he'll be discussing with us today. The talk is called Muslims for an Atheist Superpower, the Central Asian Muftiyat and Pro-Soviet Public Diplomacy in Afghanistan and Saudi Arabia in the 1970s and 80s. Aaron Tassar. What an introduction. Wow. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's a real honor to be invited by a scholar of such prominence in the field and a mentor such as Doug. And very grateful to you all for taking time out of your schedule to come and listen to my talk. Throughout the 1970s and 1980s, the only legally recognized Islamic body in Soviet Central Asia played a prominent role in Soviet public diplomacy to the Muslim world. <clears throat> Known by the Russian acronym SADUM, this organization, or Muftiate as I shall call it, was charged with running a handful of legally sanctioned mosques in the five Soviet Central Asian republics. From modest beginnings in the mid-1950s, Saddam's activities in the Muslim and developing worlds came to embrace dozens of nations throughout Asia, Africa, and ultimately Europe and America. These activities reached their peak during the 1970s and 1980s in two countries, Afghanistan and Saudi Arabia. <clears throat> in these two nations, Saddam began to serve Soviet political goals in a substantive fashion that went beyond the conduct of propaganda. In Saudi Arabia, the Muftiate came to assume the role of intermediary between the Soviet and Saudi governments. In communist-run Afghanistan, it participated actively in the project of Sovietizing the country's political institutions. In this fashion, the Muslim scholars staffing Saddam came out zealously in favor of an atheist superpower. They did so, moreover, as trusted confidants of a party state committed to liquidating religion. The Muftiate's activities in Afghanistan and Saudi Arabia raise an interesting historiographical question. How was it possible for a Muftiate not only to exist in Soviet Central Asia, but to earn the Communist Party's full confidence politically? Today I will argue that an alliance between Saddam and one large Soviet government bureaucracy formed the core of Soviet policy towards Islam. This bureaucracy, known as the Council for the Affairs of Religious Cults, or KARK for short, was created in 1943 as part of Stalin's religious reforms, which I will discuss briefly. 
By 1950, Kark and Sadum had become dependent on one another and achieved a level of cooperation that Stalin had surely not foreseen or intended. Sadum's international activism was but one dramatic manifestation of this kark sadum alliance which crystallized around 1950 and remains the defining mechanism of official regulation of Islam in Central Asia today. The structure of my talk today runs as follows. After delineating the argument's historiographical context, I will offer some background on Islam in post-war Central Asia and its treatment by the Soviet party state. I will then proceed to analyze in detail Sadum's involvement in Saudi Arabia from the mid-1940s through the mid-1980s and in Afghanistan after the 19 invasion, most substantively. I'll conclude by tying together some of the distinctive threads characterizing the Muftiyate's presence in the Saudi and Afghan contexts. In analyzing the foreign dimensions of this kark sadum alliance, I seek to build on prior scholarly discussions of Islam in the USSR, as well as Soviet religious policy more generally after World War II. The greatest and most influential commentator of Islam in the USSR was himself an active Cold Warrior. Alexander Benigsen was among the first scholars to identify Islam and the Soviet Union as a whole, as a subject of academic inquiry. Yet he believed that an accommodation between Islam and Soviet modernity was fundamentally impossible. His thinking evolved in two formative stages. During the 1960s, he argued that Soviet modernization had deprived Islam of its spiritual essence, transforming it into a form of nationhood or pillar of national identity. Two momentous events in 1979, the Iranian Revolution and the invasion of Afghanistan, prompted him to alter these views radically. Under his leadership, a growing body of commentary regarded Islam as a potential weapon undermining the Soviet state from within. According to this framework, Muslims had remained socially and morally unaltered by the Soviet experience and would therefore rebel against the party state if merely given a viable opportunity. In different ways, the contributions of Mark Saroyan and Yaakov Roy broke new ground in nuancing Benigsen's approach to Islam. Focusing primarily on the South Caucasus, Saroyan's work highlighted the different strategies Soviet Muslims used to make sense of their place in a communist society. Although Saroyan touched on the four Soviet muftiates, including Sadum, it is the recent work of Yaakov Roy that marks the first empirically rigorous treatment of these Islamic bodies as actors with organizational interests. This has been an important milestone for the study of Islam in the USSR. Unlike Saroyan, however, Roy adhered to Benigsen's basic belief that little room existed for accommodation between Islam and Soviet modernity. Through different approaches then, Saroyan and Roy have opened the door for an explanation of how Islam and communism came to coexist in Soviet Central Asia. Yet for very different reasons, neither delineated the full conceptual and political mechanism that made this accommodation possible. The scholarship on religion in the Soviet Union, which has overwhelmingly focused on the Russian Orthodox Church, has perhaps echoed a similar trajectory. During the Cold War, a number of scholars of religion in Russia closely followed the Communist Party's treatment of the Orthodox and Catholic faiths. One of the church's most famous and respected historians, Dmitry Pospilovsky, documented these policies with great precision, but also tended to emphasize their restrictive and even repressive character, even in the years following World War II. The more recent contributions of John Anderson and Tatyana Chumachenko have embraced a more nuanced view, acknowledging the influence of Soviet officials favoring a moderate approach towards religion. Yet they have not identified the extent to which this moderate line towards religion became a powerful and at times even dominant constituency within Soviet religious policymaking circles. In fact, it was due to the influence of this moderate line that the Russian Orthodox Church and Sadum arguably became the most powerful religious organizations in the USSR. That Sadum could adopt a prominent public diplomacy role in Afghanistan and Saudi Arabia was due principally to the authority of this moderate line in Soviet policy towards Islam. Although some Bolshevik figures had advocated a moderate approach towards religion during the NEP years, the religious reforms of 1943 to 44 gave the moderate line institutional substance within the Soviet political system. The reforms signified a complete rejection of the anti-religious violence that had characterized intervals of Soviet history during the 1920s and 1930s. In September of 1943, Stalin permitted the reopening of the Moscow Patriarchate of the Russian Orthodox Church. The following month, he allowed the creation of four Islamic organizations, or muftiates, spanning the entire USSR, covering the Northern Caucasus, the Southern Caucasus, Russia, and Central Asia. Similar bodies were created or formally acknowledged for the religions in the USSR. 
including the Catholic Church, a variety of smaller churches, and even for Lamaist Buddhism. Concurrently in 1943 and 44, respectively, two bureaucracies were established within the Soviet government to supervise the affairs of these legally recognized religious organizations. One of them de dealt solely with the Russian Orthodox Church. The other was known as the Council for the Affairs of Religious Cults, or KARK. KARK monitored all other religions in the USSR, including Islam. These measures constituted the most significant of Stalin's religious reforms, for they established an institutional basis for cooperation between religious figures on the one hand and Soviet bureaucrats on the other. Within less than a decade, this cooperation would achieve heights surely unforeseen by Stalin during World War II. The Moderate Lion's principal manifestation in Central Asia was the largest and wealthiest of the four Soviet muftiates, Sadum. For reasons that remain unclear, its leadership was assigned to an old family of Naqshbandi Sufi sheikhs, the Babahanovs. They remained at the organization's helm from 1943 until 1989 and staffed its ranks with their own Sufi disciples until well into the 1970s. Almost all of the first generation of Sadum's leadership had been arrested by the NKVD, either during the mid-1930s or during the Great Terror of 1937-38, then released without charge. The reasons for this, likewise, remain shrouded, shrouded in mystery, for now at least. Upon its inauguration in 1943, Sadum commenced a vigorous centralization and institution-building drive in Muslim communities across Central Asia, a process that was largely successful, and the details of which I'll not discuss here. The relationship between Kark and Sadum developed into a formidable alliance. This alliance constituted the institutional foundation of Soviet policy towards Islam in Central Asia. By the late 1940s, Kark bureaucrats had already identified a stake for themselves in Sadum's viability as an organization. Kark's representatives in the Central Asian republics and even its headquarters in Moscow strove to protect the Muftiate from interference and harassment by other bureaucracies within the Soviet government and the Communist Party. On many occasions, the bureaucrats appealed to Republican authorities to reprimand district government officials who meddled in the finances and staffing of registered mosques, a frequent occurrence. Increasingly, Kark also sought to shield the Mufti and his associates from critical voices within the Muslim community. In particular, many mosques resented the exorbitant financial demands Sadum made of them. This variety of pro-Sadum activism on the part of a Soviet bureaucracy may seem unusual, but rested upon a consistent rationale. Sadum was meant to embody the legal manifestation of Islam in an atheist society. Its organizational viability was also a measure of the viability of post-war religious policy. If Sadum failed to acquire legitimacy before the population, to put its own house in order, and to occupy a safe political niche, then the notion of a stable rule of law society would also be tarnished. Increasingly, Kark bureaucrats saw other advantages to a strong Sadum as well. They regularly consulted Sadum's staff at the local level for intelligence on unregistered or illegal religious figures, st statistics on prayer attendance, and assessment of the Muslim population's reaction to specific Soviet policies. In their advocacy on behalf of the Muftiate, the bureaucrats were further emboldened by pronouncements from the senior Soviet leadership in the early to mid-1950s. In November 1954, the Central Committee of the Communist Party issued a decree lambasting violations of the believer's legal rights by officials. The issuance of this decree reflected the internal power struggle occurring within the Politburo during these years, as Nikita Khrushchev and his detractors among Stalin's protégés sparred on religious policy as well as a number of other key policy issues. The document marked the heyday of the moderate line towards religion. Kark enjoyed unprecedented success in reversing behavior by local government officials that it deemed illegal or overly offensive. In so doing, it advanced its own authority as a bureaucracy while deepening its stake in the alliance with Sadum. The situation changed dramatically with the inauguration of Khrushchev's anti-religious campaign in 1959. This year marked the end of the moderate period of Soviet religious policy, in Central Asia at least. Now, the hard line towards religion became a viable political project for the first time since the Great Terror of 1937-38. Khrushchev's objective was to continue the Bolshevik Revolution, which he believed had been halted by the Stalinist personality cult. In his view, both Stalin's religious reforms and their subsequent trajectory in the 1950s represented a betrayal of the anti-religious cause. Large numbers of monasteries, churches, and mosques were closed across the USSR. Exorbitant fines and arbitrary, monumentally high taxes were assessed randomly upon religious figures, both registered and unregistered. It was a difficult time for Muslim figures in Central Asia, whether affiliated with Sadum or not. However, in what appears to be a paradox, 
The anti-religious campaign saw the opening of a completely new area of activity for both Kark and Sadum. This concerned pro-Soviet propaganda in the Muslim world. Khrushchev's personal dislike of religion coincided with his passionate commitment to the anti-colonial struggle. The existence of Islamic organizations staffed by religious scholars, and in particular, a substantial body such as Sadum, proved too formidable a public relations asset for the party state to ignore. While Sadum withstood severe and unprecedented restriction of its affairs at home, it heralded the freedoms enjoyed by Muslims in Soviet Central Asia before foreign audiences at home and abroad. The scope of its international engagement during the first half of the 1960s had already reached impressive dimensions. In 1963, it covered all paid visits to Central Asia by 44 delegations from Muslim organizations in 14 Asian and African countries. By 1970, it had established ties with organizations in over 50 countries. Sadum sent similar number of delegations abroad, cementing institutional ties with Islamic universities, such as Al-Azhar in Cairo. Ironically enough, then, Sadum acquired unprecedented international visibility for the first time during Khrushchev's anti-religious campaign. With Khrushchev's ouster in late 1964, the concept of mass-based revolutionary mobilization was abandoned. Brezhnev and his associates favored policy measures generating concrete benefit for both the state and the citizenry. They determined that their new religious policy after Khrushchev's ouster would reject the perceived excesses of both the moderate and hard lines. Brezhnevian religious policy would combine both to yield a regulatory policy that embraced administrative pressure mechanisms while upholding the principles of stability, consistency, and the rule of law. <coughs> By 1970 or so then, the kark sadum alliance had become an institutional presence in Soviet religious policy with domestic as well as foreign implications. As we have seen, even Khrushchev's anti-religious campaign did not significantly undermine the alliance's relevance at home, while it increased its prominence and therefore indispensability abroad. It was in this context that a shift occurred in the Muftiate's already substantial engagement around 1970. After this point, Sadum was treated as an official Soviet entity for the purposes of international public diplomacy, a quasi-official Ministry of Islamic Affairs in all but name, on the international front at least. Inside Central Asia, the most dramatic indication of this was Sadum's incorporation into the programming of the Central Committee of Uzbekistan's Communist Party. Representative from foreign communist parties visiting Tashkent, including the communist parties of Bangladesh, India, and Italy, were taken to visit the Mufti at Sadum's headquarters. This would have been an unthinkable prospect at any point before the 1970s. This trend also found reflection in the close and very public collaboration of Sadum, Kark, and the Soviet Ministry of Foreign Affairs in organizing international peace conferences, as they were then known. Even as it remained nominally committed to liquidating religion then, the Soviet party state abandoned any inhibitions about its close cooperation with an Islamic organization. <coughs> One can observe this trend most clearly in the evolution of Sadum's activities in Saudi Arabia from the mid-1940s through the mid-1980s. During these four decades, it is possible to document a steady politicization of the annual Soviet Hajj delegation sent to Mecca and Medina. Whereas in the 1940s, the Soviet state regarded the Hajj as a matter of no international political significance, by the 1970s, the Hajj morphed into an annual diplomatic mission by Sadum's senior staff. <coughs> Sadum's ties with Saudi entities were longstanding. In this respect, the Saudi case differs from Afghanistan, which the Muftiate barely had any contact with until late 1979, and Egypt, which was Sadum's strongest Middle Eastern contact until the de deterioration of Soviet-Egyptian relations throughout the 1970s. The Saudi context was also distinct in that Saudi Arabia was the only country Sadum engaged that the Soviet government did not recognize diplomatically. The changing nature of the Muftiate's involvement in the kingdom paralleled the evolution of policy towards Islam in, so in Soviet Central Asia. As the Muftiate's role in the domestic political landscape became more ingrained and predictable, so too did its function in the Saudi context acquire greater significance for the Soviet state politically. At the height of World War II, Stalin permitted the four Muftiates to send a small party of Hajis to perform the pilgrimage to Mecca. This was part of the package of religious reforms that he had authorized in 1943-44. The group, which was dominated by Sadum's senior staff, traveled in late 1944 through Iran to Egypt and finally on to the two holy cities. An official report on their travel, prepared after extensive debriefings conducted with the Hajis upon their return to Central Asia, indicates that Soviet officials viewed the trip purely as a matter of domestic public diplomacy. 
written by a Kark bureaucrat, the report offered no insight on Saudi political figures or the country's political system. This despite the fact that the crown prince of Mecca and future monarch, Amir Faisal, as well as the Qadis of Mecca and Medina, all organized special banquets in the Soviet pilgrims' honor. Instead, the report enumerated the names of various members of the Turkestani diaspora in Saudi Arabia, whom the Soviet pilgrims interacted with. In particular, it highlighted the presence of so-called anti-Soviet figures who had fled Soviet Central Asia for the Middle East during the Cultural Revolution and the Great Terror. With Khrushchev's rise to power in the late 1950s, the Hajj's functions expanded beyond this limited niche envisioned by the Stalinist political system. During this period, the explicit purpose of the Hajj, in official circles at least, became the conduct of pro-Soviet propaganda in the Muslim world. This emerged most clearly in a set of written instructions Kark issued to each pilgrim embarking upon the Hajj in 1959. The document instructed pilgrims in the various channels they might pursue in conducting propaganda on behalf of the party state. It stated, <coughs> representatives of the spiritual boards and believing Muslims traveling on the Hajj to Mecca must remember that they are first and foremost citizens of the great Soviet Union, that in all their actions and statements abroad, they should be guided by the interests of our homeland and not permit any behavior that might diminish the achievements of Soviet citizens and their homeland. Kark further charged the Hajis with establishing contacts with Chinese Muslims and instructed them to stress their sympathy for the Algerian independence struggle when interacting with North African Hajis. It also stressed the need to exchange contact information with Saudi Arabian religious officials, with a view to subsequently inviting them to the USSR in an official capacity. This marked a dramatic departure from the tone of Saddam's involvement in Saudi Arabia under late Stalinism and in its immediate aftermath. Now, the kingdom became one of the many battlegrounds for the hearts and minds of common folk in the Muslim and developing worlds. To this end, Kark carefully screened applicants for the Hajj from Central Asia, not only for their political reliability, as one might expect, but even for their physical attractiveness. The candidacy of some applicants was downgraded due to physical liabilities such as stuttering, twitching eyelids, stoutness, and an unseemly gait. The objective was to present model Soviet Muslims to the outside world, who would assure their co-religionists that Islam, Islam was alive and well inside the USSR and that the Communist Party was a friend to Islamic peoples the world over. The premium on propaganda value, both at home and abroad, remained the primary official justification for the Hajj delegation's presence in the Saudi holy cities. Things changed abruptly, however, in 1972. In this year, Saddam established a formal relationship with a Saudi organization in many respects resembling itself, the Mecca-based Muslim World League. Established in 1962 by representatives from 22 countries, the organization received virtually all of its financing from the Saudi government. Like Saddam, the explicit justification for its existence was apparently to serve as a nominally independent propaganda arm of the Soviet government. Its publication agenda was anti-communist, anti-missionary, anti-Zionist, and in favor of propagating Salafi ideas. al Harakani, the League's Secretary General, for much of the 1970s and 1980s, had a direct link to King Khalid. Therefore, the interface between Saddam and the League rapidly became an informal meeting ground between the Soviet and Saudi governments. It is, in fact, likely that the relationship materialized precisely to facilitate such communication between the two states. The two bodies attempted to consolidate some sort of institutional partnership, even as they sporadically skirmished on areas of Saudi-Soviet contention, such as Afghanistan and southern Yemen. As of 1981, the League began handling all the logistical formalities of the Soviet pilgrims' arrival in Saudi Arabia, a significant gesture given the hassle experienced by Hajis in earlier years. Senior figures at the League also went out of their way to praise the religiosity of Soviet Muslims in numerous meetings. Saddam welcomed the decision of the Mission of the Mosque Conference in 1980 to translate the Quran into all the languages of the USSR, though this, though this could conceivably be seen as an attempt to undermine the Muftiate's authority at home. In a similar vein, the League sent copies of a pamphlet to Tashkent detailing the proper performance of Hajj rites and rituals, with a request that Saddam distribute it to each pilgrim. It also set aside five stipends for graduates of the two Soviet madrasas in Uzbekistan to study at Islamic universities in Morocco, Tunisia, and Algeria, though not Saudi Arabia. In its dealings with the League, the Muftiate consistently bore the interests of the Soviet government in mind. 
While the Saudis wished to use Saddam as a means of projecting their global message into the Soviet Union, the Muftiate availed itself of the opportunity to test the waters of a potential Soviet Saudi thaw. It was Saddam's third Mufti, Shamsuddin Han Babahanov, who pursued this agenda most energetically. In 1981, he penned a proposal to Kark that reflected significant personal investment in the issue. He suggested exploiting the League's missionary drive to realize eventual diplomatic relations between the two countries. As he recounted in his report to Kark, the League's leadership had invited him to a meeting at its headquarters at Mina during the Hajj of 1981. At the meeting, the Saudi body's deputy chair for the affairs of mosques submitted a two-part proposal to Shamsuddin Han, the Mufti. First, the four Soviet Muftiates would establish a council of mosques of the USSR under the leadership of Saddam to serve as an organizational interface with the League. Second, the Saudis would conduct one to two month seminars on Islamic dogma in the building of Saddam's upper level madrasa in Tashkent. Abdel Fattah Mansour, a League employee who also attended the meeting, offered reassurance that he had recently conducted such seminars in Uganda and Yugoslavia, and they bear a neutral character not touching upon the politics of the country in question. Shamsuddin Han offered the following rationale for responding to both initiatives in the affirmative. As he proposed to Kark, we feel that both these suggestions merit sufficiently serious attention and study by all four Muslim boards, that is Muftiates, of the USSR. Our positive response to this proposal would give us the opportunity to cement regular contact with the League. In addition to what would be gained, this would facilitate positive changes in the League's attitude towards the Soviet Union. Through the salutary influence of the League, this could lead to the establishment of direct relations with the Saudi authorities. Assenting to such seminars would aid us in neutralizing and mitigating the anti-Soviet tendencies of the mass media of one of the most reactionary regimes in the Arab East and the Islamic world, especially given the increasingly complex international situation, the Afghan and Iranian events, and the rising global prominence of the Islamic factor. In this fashion, Saddam's Mufti proposed allowing Wahhabi Saudi preachers into Central Asia to conduct dogma classes with aspiring Soviet imams. The Mufti was no novice to the Soviet political landscape. He was a seasoned political operator who devoted a good portion of his tenure to hosting and visiting foreign heads of state and ministers. Although Kark did not ultimately approve this proposal, its very authorship is therefore of great significance. Saddam was comfortable asserting its role as a bridge between two governments, functioning in effect as a semi-official diplomatic arm for the Soviet state. The timing of Shamsuddin Han's proposal was also significant. Two years earlier, in 1979, both the invasion of Afghanistan and the Islamic Revolution in Iran had put the Islamic factor, as it was then called, onto the radar screen of the Communist Party's Central Committee in Moscow. Available Central Committee decrees indicate a high level of concern about the USSR's image in the Muslim world and about the potential for harmful influences from the Middle East and Afghanistan to undermine Soviet rule in Central Asia. On the ground in Central Asia itself, however, the picture was very different. Policy towards Islam and the five republics did not change radically in the early 1980s. Instead, it witnessed an acceleration of trends already in place as of the late 1960s. From Khrushchev's ouster in 1964, Brezhnevian policy towards Islam facilitated the steady consolidation of an apparatus, the level of local government to regulate religion. This involved an increasingly effective restriction of religion that did not exhibit the intensity, volatility, and violence of earlier decades. It also featured more effective penetration of anti-religious propaganda into the lives of ordinary Muslims. Therefore, the Mufti made his aforementioned proposal to Kark in a political setting that for the most part treated Islam as a possible threat on the international front, but not as a potential source of major instability at home. This gave the Kark Sadum alliance the kind of credibility that allowed the Mufti to even contemplate inviting Wahhabi preachers into his madrasa cl classroom in Soviet Uzbekistan. The Saudi case I have described is striking for the evolution of an Islamic organization into an apparent bridge between a religious monarchy and an atheist single party state. In the case of the communist-run Democratic Republic of Afghanistan, Saddam's political utility to the Soviet state was even more direct and much more public. After the Soviet invasion in December 1979, the Soviet state hastily, and perhaps desperately, enlisted Saddam's support to Sovietize the Afghan communist policies towards Islam. In using the, the term Sovietization, I rely on Olivier Roy's definition as, I'm quoting, a process by which Afghanistan should be made to look like the Soviet Muslim republics. 
through the exportation of Soviet institutions to Afghanistan, the creation of a new generation educated by Soviet curricula, and finally the establishment of the monopoly of a strong communist party. Soviet officials involved in Afghan affairs as well as their colleagues in the People's Democratic Party of Afghanistan, the, the PDPA, the Afghan Communist Party, fashioned Saddam as a model for relations between Islam and the state in the new socialist Afghanistan. Soviet officials envisioned exporting a framework for church-state relations that had produced a stable space for Islam in a society ruled by atheists. Saddam was meant to assist the Afghan communists in building up and consolidating a muftiate modeled on itself. One can therefore speak of the Muftiate not as an intermediary between the Soviet and Afghan states, but rather as an implementer of Soviet policies in the war-ravaged country throughout the 1980s. Sadum encouraged the Afghan communists to consolidate a centralized religious hierarchy resembling the Central Asian Muftiate, espousing a progressive, modern, pro-socialist Islam. This endeavor complemented the PDPA's own policies towards an Islam in Afghanistan. These policies had changed radically upon Hafizullah Amin's death during the 1979 invasion and the Soviet's subsequent installation of Babrak Karmal in power. Eager to reduce the central government's alienation, the Soviets required the newly constituted Afghan socialist government to release political prisoners. In his first attempt to Sovietize religious policy, Karmal created what was effectively a fledgling Afghan muftiate, known as the Department of Islamic Affairs, in 1982. Many of the figures installed in its senior ranks came from secular backgrounds and lacked popular recognition as theologians. Karmal's policies were designed both to foster reconciliation between Afghanistan's religious figures and the government and to establish some sort of centralized agency for regulating Islam. Thus, an opening, existed with, an opening existed within Afghan socialist officialdom for Sadum to present its role in Soviet Central Asia as a model for church-state relations. The Muftiate articulated this idea through three areas of activity. First, it conducted propaganda in the Muslim world on behalf of the Soviet occupation, arguing for the compatibility of Islam and socialism and for the merits of the Soviet invasion. Second, the Muftiate invited high-level Afghan officials to Central Asia to showcase the prosperity of Islam and Muslims in the Soviet Union. Third, Sadum sent regular representatives to advise Soviet and Afghan agencies in Kabul and to work closely with Afghan religious figures. Within weeks of the Soviet invasion in late 1979, Sadum began hosting delegations of religious figures allied or affiliated with the Afghan communists. Before this point, its Afghan contacts had ranked few and far between, paling in comparison even to its engagement with nations as distant as Indonesia and Burkina Faso. The reasons for this are not entirely clear. Nevertheless, the Muftiate's sudden introduction into the Afghan scene speaks to the confidence it enjoyed in official eyes and perhaps the desperation of the country's would-be Sovietizers. Sadum began sending regular delegations to the country in 1981. They were received with great pomp and publicity by the Soviet embassy in Kabul, as well as various Afghan entities, including the Ministry of Justice and pro-socialist religious figures. Saddam's involvement came to embrace the highest echelons of the PDPA and Afghan government hierarchies. This was perhaps best illustrated by the visit of Saddam's deputy chair to Kabul in September of 1986, during which he met with the deputy chairman of the Afghan Council of Ministers, the chief justice, the minister of religious affairs, and the secretary of the PDPA central committee, Nur Ahmad Nur. The Saddam representative's minutes from his meeting with Nur indicate that by the mid-1980s, Sadum had successfully positioned itself as a model for the religious policy of the Democratic Republic of Afghanistan. First, Nur requested assistance in the establishment of an Islamic Institute of Afghanistan to showcase Soviet aid, as he put it, not only in the areas of economics, culture, and technical development, but also in the area of religion. Nur clearly wished to model this institution after Sadum's Imam al-Buhari Islamic Institute, established in Tashkent in 1971. Second, as Noor put it, Afghan religious figures needed to learn about leading religious concepts that were worked out and perfected in the condi conditions of authentic socialism in the USSR. Third, he wished to increase mutual travel between the two countries' ulama. Fourth, with assistance from Sadum, the Afghan Ministry of Islamic Affairs would produce, produce an official publication closely mirroring the Muftiate's own Muslims of the Soviet Union, advocating the compatibility of Islam and socialism. Fifth, he, desired his, he expressed his desire to have Sadum's journal translated into Urdu 
as a means of spreading word about the Soviet Muftiate and its dogmatic pronouncements to the problematic Pashtun tribes across the border in Pakistan. Finally, Sadum would assist the relevant Afghan authorities in drafting curricula for religious students, as well as fatwas, since, in his words, the Afghan ulama understand Quranic teachings in an utterly superficial fashion. Such intensive ties envisioned by Nur found their natural culmination later that same year, when Abdullayev, I'm sorry, the, uh, the, the deputy director of Sadum, delivered an address to a Luya Jirga, or nationwide gathering of the Pushtun tribes in Kabul. In this fashion, both the Soviet and Afghan authorities encouraged Sadum to assume a pedagogical role towards Afghan religious figures allied with the regime. The Muftiate opened up spots in its madrasas in Uzbekistan for Afghan students, and also donated thousands of copies of its edition of the Quran, produced in Tashkent, to the Afghan Ministry of Justice. These were highly symbolic gestures, since Afghanistan had a shortage of, shortage of neither madrasas nor Qurans. Saddam's role was clear enough that Afghanistan's fledgling muftiate even asked it to establish a political advisory office in Kabul, though it is unclear if this ever came to fruition. The pedagogical posture of the Central Asian muftiate manifested itself in other ways as well. During their visits to Kabul, the muftiate's staff praised Afghan religious figures who had read Marx and Lenin, and also took pains to correct their rec recitation of the Quran and Arabic pronunciation. The objective was to position the Central Asian Muftiate and its staff as an institutional ideal the Afghan communists and their allies might aspire to. This fell in line with the broader contours of the Sovietization initiative more generally. It is therefore not surprising to find discussions in Kabul expanding beyond the topic of religion. Sadum articulated Central Asia's social and economic development under Soviet rule as a path for the new Afghanistan to follow. Take, for example, the following communique, issued after a 1986 roundtable between Sadum and the Afghan Ministry of Religious Affairs. The parties presented their own approaches to the interpretation of individual selections of the Quran and Hadiths, dealing in particular with land reform and setting aside plots for the landless peasantry. The Afghan side expressed its desire to acquire citations from respected Islamic sources in this respect. The Soviet side listed an array of fundamental texts which should be consulted for arguments con concerning the realization of land reform in the country. Questions related to women's rights, education, and labor likewise underwent discussion, as did the protection of motherhood and the Quranic bases of the Democratic Republic of Afghanistan's efforts towards the defense of children and the disadvantaged segments of the population. The Muftiate heralded Central Asia, and particularly the social development and economic prosperity it believed the region's population had achieved under Soviet rule, as an example of how religion could thrive in a fully progressive society. Hence, as the communique stressed, the need for cooperation between the Afghan ulama and the ulama of the Central Asian republics and the resolution of those questions that currently concern the Afghan people. The implicit argument was that Central Asian Muslims had successfully replied upon their Islamic heritage to work through some of the problems then facing Afghanistan. This was a legacy the Afghans should follow in letter by establishing a muftiate, and in spirit, by pursuing the ideal of a modern pro-socialist Islam. This perhaps constituted the most comprehensive justification Saddam could conceivably develop for Sovietizing Afghan religious policy. As we have seen, Saddam served Soviet political objectives in Saudi Arabia and Afghanistan in distinct but related ways. Whether openly or behind the scenes, it functionally behaved as a diplomatic agency of the Soviet state. Nikita Khrushchev gave birth to this role for the Muftiate in the mid-1950s, when he realized that a Soviet Islamic organization could reach audiences that a Soviet government organization could not. Around the late 1970s, it dawned upon Soviet policymakers, most notably in Kark and the Foreign Affairs Ministry, that Sadum was uniquely positioned to enhance certain substantive foreign policy objectives as well. Like any organization in the USSR, whether inside the government hierarchy or not, the Muftiate operated under close scrutiny at multiple levels. Yet the significance and prominence of its role during the 1970s and 1980s cannot be denied, especially given that Central Asian Islamic scholars filled its senior ranks. I have argued that Sadum played all but an official Soviet role in two Muslim countries of great geopolitical significance in the 1970s and 1980s. This argument offers a basis for re-examining the Soviet state's posture towards an understanding of Islam during the Brezhnev and Andropov years in Central Asia. Here I would like to come back to the writings of Alexander Benningson, 
whose work I referenced at the outset of this talk. Although Bennigsen's ideas on Islam and the Soviet Union have been challenged on a number of fronts in recent years, his verdict on the impact of the Afghan invasion has not. Bennigsen used two types of sources to support his claims that Islam posed a threat to the stability of the Soviet state after 1979, and that Soviet policymakers regarded the Muslim faith in this vein, that is, with great trepidation. First, he used published and unpublished decrees of the Central Committee of the Communist Party, which throughout the 1970s and 1980s did undeniably refer to Islam in precisely these terms. Second, he relied on Soviet social science literature, including the massive body of so-called concrete sociological analysis of Islam that came into vogue in the 1970s. He lacked the source material to determine how Moscow's concern about Islam translated into the actual implementation of Soviet religious policy in Central Asia. It was therefore quite easy for him and his associates to dismiss Saddam's public diplomacy abroad as the work of red mullahs and collaborators with the party state, whose activities bore no broader political significance for the landscape of Islam and state in Soviet Central Asia. In fact, Saddam's activities in Saudi Arabia and Afghanistan rested at the very core of Soviet policy towards Islam and help explain why these policies did not change dramatically in the domestic context after 1979. By offering political utility to the party state in foreign as well as domestic settings, the Muftiate extended renewed strength to the Kark Saddam alliance. This alliance constituted the best conceivable administrative foundation for the coexistence of Islam and communism in a society ruled by atheists. This conclusion forces us to ask what atheism actually meant to the Soviet party state in the 1970s and 1980s. There is no denying that the Communist Party's commitment to liquidating religion remained intact until perestroika. Yet, as we have seen, large religious organizations existed in permanent institutionalized form, and in Central Asia at least, a very substantial political space emerged for Islam. The answer is that the realization of mass atheism, like any political ideal, was ultimately subject to compromise in favor of more salient considerations. Saddam's political utility undoubtedly constituted one such consideration, but there were others as well. For one, the entire post-war period of Soviet history is permeated by a sense of resignation that Islam was more fanatical, harder to understand, too diffuse to effectively target, and ultimately more difficult to stamp out than other faiths. It also cannot be denied that the most prominent anti-religious hardliners in the Bolshevik party reserved their personal animus for the faith they knew best, Russian Orthodoxy. In other words, all the right pieces were in place for Islam to do relatively well out of the Soviet experience, at least after World War II. This surely helps explain why an Islamic organization could conduct official Soviet business in any capacity whatsoever in two uniformly Muslim nations. Thank you.